Please be seated. Well, happy Father's Day, everyone. (laughs) A day first nationally so designated in 1972. For many of us, seems rather recent, right? And a day that has, thankfully, evolved to celebrate all those in our lives who stepped up and assumed the responsibility of being fatherly to us when circumstances called for it. First, some context for my perspective today. I am the father of two wonderful men who I'm gradually relying on more and more as I get older. Regrettably, by now they have heard all my stories. (laughs) But thankfully, they still generously nod as if they have never heard them before, right? (laughs) That is true love, right? I'm also a grandfather, along with my good friend Mark Wieter-Anders, who's sitting over here and sings in the choir of two grandchildren. And yes, one of my sons had the good fortune of falling in love with the daughter of two of our good friends, Mark and Esta. It doesn't get much better than that, right? My father, unfortunately, died suddenly when I was three years old leaving an unemployed wife to grieve and find a way to care for and raise three children, ages 3, 12, and 13. She raised us as a widow. And as I know was the case for many mothers, society required her to assume the role of father or mother depending on the circumstance. This was often very awkward, but she did it. I have a lasting memory of feeling a bit embarrassed in 1959 at age 10, standing with her in a long, long line of fathers and sons as she dressed in a business suit and white gloves, made sure that I was signed up for Little League Baseball. I also remember that same year when my elementary school's PTA arranged for separate meetings for mothers and daughters and sons and fathers to learn about the birds and the bees, as it was known back then. (laughs) Showing up with me to a room full of strange men with their sons discussing sex was apparently a bridge too far from my mom. (laughs) So I didn't attend. I was left with my best friend confusingly and horrifyingly telling me how babies were made. (laughs) My reaction, you liar. (laughs) My mother calling up fatherly energy had to step in at that point and confirm that it was not a lie. (laughs) Yuck. (laughs) So, in raising my boys with Sue, I have always recognized that the two of us would face circumstances when each of us individually would have to call up father or mother energy to address a situation when the other was unavailable to do so. This is the true reality of parenting, especially during 
this era of our American experiment. Whether we are raised by a single parent, two parents of the same gender, or by a male and female couple, in all of these families, a parent on occasion is required to take on fatherly or motherly roles and responsibilities depending on the circumstances. So today we are not celebrating masculinity, a problematic term brimming with controversy and confusion. Today we are celebrating and giving thanks for all the acts of fatherly love that we have benefited from regardless of, the, of what human being in our lives was actually responsible for it. Now, fundamental to our beliefs as Christians is the historical fact that God chose to partially reveal his nature in the form of Jesus, a male human being. In doing so, he revealed what qualities, virtues, and values we should all strive for in fulfilling his command to love and care for one another, especially in nurturing children. Now I have heard more than one female priest or pastor say that Mary conceived a male rather than a female child because God trusted that women were smart enough to recognize that Jesus' messaging and modeling for us was not specific to his gender. I see Jackie Lynn nodding here. <laughs> St. Julian of Norwich, the 14th century mystic that is near and dear to my heart, reminds us of this when she interchangeably refers to Jesus as a mother. What we have in Jesus is a profound clarification in our understanding of God's nature. You see, before Jesus, scripture is brimming with celebrations of historical figures from judges to kings, from warriors to wives, who engaged in violence and coercion purportedly done in righteous faithfulness to what they believed was a God inclined toward vengeance and punishment for those falling short in obedience, inflicting blindness, barrenness, disease, and military defeat, to name a few actions attributed to God. Jesus is a clarifying revelation. In Jesus, God discloses that he has no wrath but rather is loving, patient, and forgiving in nature, and importantly, a God that highly values extending sacrificial, non-self-serving love to others. And it is this type of love that we are honoring today, what we designate as Father's Day. I have little doubt that there are abundant examples all around us of this type of sacrificial love being extended on behalf of those close to us. However, I confess I'm concerned that our current culture in America has turned away from the deep and broader sacrificial love that Jesus modeled. We seem to be living with the excesses of what I suspect is 60 plus years of hyper individualism. There's a lot of emphasis in our culture on personal prerogatives and self-centered autonomy, but little in the sharing of an ethos that puts relationship over self. Acquaintances of mine often tell me that they are spiritual or even religious. But their conception of faith is so individualized that they feel no need to practice it with anyone else. 
much less tie themselves to any specific community. In contrast, for Jesus, we precedes me. He modeled and called us to shared values, deep hospitality, and showing up for one another, radical mutuality. Now, social scientists tell us that self-centeredness is natural. People are motivated by money, power, and status. But the countercultural Jesus was not motivated by any of these things. He called people to live in right relationship with others and to serve the common good. My hope today is that there will be a shift in what kind of men and women, fathers and mothers, we admire and what sort we disdain. The lone wolf has had his day. What we need are men and women, fathers and mothers, strong enough to bind themselves into communities. Communities much like ours here at St. Michael's. Communities that love across boundaries, listen patiently, see deeply, and make everyone feel known. Communities that bring a bit of the light of Christ into view. Now, culture changes when small groups such as ours find a better way to live. And other people begin to copy them. As I shared last week at the 5 p.m. service, the author Malcolm Gladwell in his book, The Tipping Point, calls these people or groups mavens. And clearly, Jesus was the greatest maven the world has ever known. He was a relationalist and not an individualist. He practiced interdependence, not disassociation. He was deeply embedded in his community with his followers and on behalf of all of us. So today, Father's Day, let us be grateful for those in our lives that blessed us with fatherly love in this sense. And let us commit to sharing that kind of love with others like the mavens God as Jesus called us to be. Amen.